This podcast is presented to you by Pastor Derek Armstrong and Word of Grace Community Church. For more information, please visit WOGCC.com. Well, let's go ahead and get in James this morning. Let's go to James chapter 3. If uh, this is your first time here at Word of Grace, just to catch you up a little bit, we have been going verse by verse through the book of James, and we're in week three, study three. I would recommend that if you missed any, that you would go back and you would watch those um, via video, or you can listen to them on audio, uh, because I believe this is going to be a great study for us. It's really going to help us to grow. And we've learned some things about James in context, because we always want to look at Scripture in context. We want to know who the author is. We want to know what was happening, who was he writing to. So remember, James was the half-brother of Jesus, and he was writing as the pastor of the church in Jerusalem to other churches because he had a significant seat of influence because he was the pastor of the church over Jerusalem. And so he was writing to these other churches because they had gotten really cocky and really prideful in their knowledge. They thought because they knew so much that that meant they were spiritual. The same thing that we see happen today in the same tactic of the enemy to try to tempt us to make us think higher of ourselves than we should. Because we think if I know all this stuff, then that means that I'm a spiritual person because I have all of this head knowledge. I can quote all of these scriptures or I know all of these religious practices and I have all of these things checked off of the list and that makes me a spiritual person. And James was saying, no, 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 you guys need to see what true spirituality is, what true maturity is. Because James, even last week, we discovered that the churches that James was writing to were showing partiality to people who were rich and people who were poor. And he said, guys, this shouldn't be. This should not be the fruit of someone who is a mature believer in Christ. You shouldn't be showing favoritism to people who are wealthy, who come up in their Mercedes camels and give them the prime parking spots. You shouldn't show partiality to those who come in wearing fine clothes and those who have gold jewelry on that you treat them better than you treat the poor people. That shouldn't be the way that someone who has been affected by the gospel, that shouldn't be how they act and react in those situations. You need to treat others the same. And then remember in verse 1, he talked about going through trials and persecutions and how actually the grace of God will help us to navigate those things if we're willing to see ourselves as how we really are and not look in a mirror and walk away and forget what we look like, but we'll actually endure through seeing the ugliness of who we are so we can see the goodness of who he is and it will actually cause good things to come out of us in our hearts. That's what he talked about in the second chapter of those good works that should actually follow or flow out of a life that's been impacted by the grace of God, by the gospel. And so now James is still in that same vein. He hasn't taken a left turn. He's still talking about about the same thing to the same group of people. So let's pick that up in James 3 and verse 1. James 3 and verse 1 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Let's stop right there. First of all, James makes a very scary claim to any of those who have a responsibility and a call to teach. He says, don't go after this position. He says, because you're actually going to be judged with a stricter judgment. It needs to be a calling, not just something that you want to do. Amen, somebody? You see, the reason that he was saying this was because the people that he was addressing had this idea that if I'm in a position of teaching, then I'm important, then I'm significant, then I matter. Then you can look at me and see how spiritual I am because I'm smart enough to teach this stuff. I'm smart enough to be able to speak that better than James or better than Apollos or better than Paul. I know this stuff so well I can teach it. And so you need to make me a teacher. And these guys were chasing after positions of teaching because they saw the crowds that would follow these guys. They saw the pedestal these guys would be put upon. And they wanted that just for that reason. And they thought, this is going to make me spiritual if I can teach because I'm so stinking smart. And he said, you better be careful. You better be careful because you're actually thinking that being a teacher makes you mature. But let me tell you, I know a lot of people who teach Scripture that have no idea what maturity is even all about. I have a lot of people that I know that are in positions of teaching that think they're mature because they're teachers, because they have a title, because they have a church, or because they have a ministry. 
They think that just because they've achieved those things means they're mature. And that's exactly what the people James is writing to dealt with also. They thought, if I can become a teacher, then I'm going to be mature. Because in verse 2, he talks about this perfect man. And that word perfect, maybe your translation says mature, but that word perfect is the Greek word teleos. And that word teleos means complete, whole, or mature. He's still talking about the same stuff he was talking about in chapters 1 and 2. He's talking about maturing in the faith through the grace of God changing your life. And James audience obviously thought the same thing many of us think today that if i'm in a position if i'm on a stage if i'm behind a podium if people are listening to what i have to say then i must be extremely mature but he said you don't understand the weight of the position you see they were more interested in appearing mature through position without truly understanding what maturity actually meant so I believe that James 3 is truly a message of defining what maturity is. So if you're a note taker, write this title down, Maturity Defined. As we go through the book of James in the third chapter, I believe he really defines maturity for us in a way that we can grab a hold of this and go, I need to let this be a litmus test in my own heart to see am I deceived in thinking I'm mature when actually I'm looking at things incorrectly. You see, maturity doesn't seek attention. And this is one of the things that he was addressing that people were obviously seeking after. And he just let them know, you're going to be judged with a stricter judgment. So don't chase after this if you think that just getting a bunch of attention and getting a position makes you mature. Because those who are truly mature are not after the accolades. Matter of fact, I hang out with people that are older than me and wiser than me. And when I hang out with those people, the, the, the people that I truly take counsel from, those are people who are not impressed with me. And those are the types of people we need in our lives who can speak candidly and honestly and forthrightly with us. Amen? Amen. People who don't put us up on a pedestal and who aren't impressed, they know that you're going to have marriage issues. They know that you're going to have financial issues. They know that you're going to have uh, issues that you have to work through from wounds of your past, and they don't expect you to be this perfect person. But sometimes people put you up on this pedestal that they don't think you can do anything wrong. And then they begin to follow you around, and, and, and people think just because they have a following, that means that those people surely must be mature, but those people love that. They bask in that. They bask in people needing them. They love, they love feeling like they're needed. They love the attention from that. But if they're really mature, they'd realize, listen, I don't need to seek after attention. I need to allow my life to point people to Jesus, not to a codependency upon me. Hello, somebody. You see, maturity doesn't seek position or self-elevation, but rather maturity submits and humbles themselves to God and allows God to open doors in their lives when He says they're ready, not when they feel like they're qualified. So many people want to create doors and open doors for themselves because they feel like they're ready. They may have been overlooked before. They may have been passed over in their own mind. And people think, oh, I have all this experience, I have all this knowledge, just like the people James was writing to. And he says, you got to make sure that you carry the understanding of the weight and that you don't make this about you seeking attention and garnering some type of following for yourself because maturity does not seek attention. Matter of fact, Peter said to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and in due season he will exalt you, he will promote you. When it's time, he will open the door that no man can shut. Not you having to kick down or create some type of door for yourself. Amen, somebody? Amen. When people do that, they're seeking attention. They're trying to fill some type of void in their own woundedness. And the most dysfunctional teachers, leaders, and pastors I know are people who do not submit to authority. They don't want submission to authority because they want to be in charge. They want to run the show. And oftentimes, their lives and their ministries are driven by their personality and not driving people to the Scripture and the Word of God. And it's very dangerous because they don't consider the weight of the judgment that they're going to be put under. Because 
James says, don't chase after that stuff because, man, don't you know there's a stricter judgment to that? This is a calling. This is not something you have the power to create or do. Why are you seeking after this? Because they thought if they could get it, then people would look at them and say, oh, look at how spiritual those people are. They've got the answers there. No, that causes division, that causes hurt, that causes all kinds of junk that doesn't glorify God and only wounds people in their wake because they're driven by their selfishness and they're speaking negativity oftentimes because they think they're better and smarter than other people because they're like, look at me, look at me. They're seeking after attention. But maturity doesn't seek after attention. Maturity doesn't speak death and negativity. Maturity speaks life. Oh, amen, somebody. Maturity speaks life. Proverbs 18.21 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue and those that love it are going to eat the fruit of it. So you got to think, am I speaking negativity? Am I speaking divisively? Am I spreading gossip? Am I causing harm to others through my words to try to harm another? If I'm doing that, then I need to have a checkup in my heart to truly grade and judge, am I as mature as I think I am? Because if I truly am mature, the fruit of my maturity should cause me to speak life. I should be speaking life, and that should be something that I'm driven and drawn to do. Let's keep on reading. James chapter 3 and verse 3. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so they will obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Something very small. Look at a ship. They're so large, and they're driven by strong winds, but they're guided by a very small rudder. Wherever the pilot wants to go, that little small rudder, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life. And it's set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, a reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and our Father, and then we turn around and curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. The tongue can't be tamed because the noise that it's making is truly coming as a result of what's in the heart. Jesus said, out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks. So many times people try to tame the tongue because they think, if I can tame the tongue, if I can discipline my speech... Then everyone will think I'm spiritual. Everyone will think I'm mature if I can just say the right things in the right moment. Oh, hallelujah, bless the Lord, praise the Lord, amen, brother. And we think if we get all the speech right, and all the these and thou's right, and all of the T's crossed and the I's dotted just right, then that means that we're spiritual. And James says, even if you work really hard... To try to control your tongue, you can't do it because your tongue is just the thing making the sound from what's really in your heart. And if grace hasn't influenced your heart, then the parts that grace has not touched are still going to come out of your mouth and it just shows that we still need Jesus. And it still shows that we need grace. And it still shows that we need the gospel. And it still shows that we need the Holy Spirit working in us and through us to bring glory to God. Because how quickly can we turn negative? How quickly can we turn south and selfish? But yet we'll try to tame our tongue around the right people. You know, we had a really bad day. And when there's been a bunch of negativity, a bunch of gossip, a bunch of perverse junk coming out of our mouth but then all of a sudden a different person comes by and we can turn it on i saw a video of jack black in a hotel that he was staying in and the hotel manager she came up to him when he came out of his room and she had her cell phone and she videoed jack black now nacho libre is one of my favorite movies i think it's absolute cinematic genius 
Jack Black played in Nacho Libre, and it was hilarious. And that movie was made like eight, nine years ago, okay? And this lady, this hotel manager, comes out, finds Jack Black, records him with her cell phone, and she asks him if they can sing a song together from that movie. And Jack Black is just trying to get out of the hotel, but the manager's got him cornered, and, he's, and she's got her cell phone. So he obliges, and he says, okay, which song do you want to sing? And she starts singing a song from the movie. And as soon as she starts singing, just like that, he turns into Nacho Libre, and it blew me away. And he sang the song. I don't know when the last time this man sang that song, because that movie was made quite a few years ago, and he's even made movies since then. But he turned on that character and sang it word for word, even with the emotion and the energy and the actions that he did as if he had just filmed it yesterday. And I was like, how does he do that? That's why he gets paid the big bucks to act, because he can transform into someone else in any given moment. The sad thing is, is that too many times in church, we get so well rehearsed in our role that the right person comes by our way, just like that hotel manager, and we can turn it on. And we can put the mask on. And we can try to tame the tongue. And we can try to say all the right things. And if we work really hard to say the right things around that person, then we think we've got them fooled. But then around other people, evil things come out of our heart. Because it's showing by what we speak. Jesus said in Matthew 12 and 33, he said, either make the tree good and the fruit good or the tree bad and the fruit bad. He said, but a tree is going to be known by its fruit. What comes out of our heart, the abundance of that's what's speaking. So if our life is being transformed by the gospel of Jesus, of Jesus Christ, then when we speak, it should show that we're being influenced and impacted by the gospel. Amen. If we just learn all the cues and we memorize all the things to say, then we're no better than just a movie actor remembering a character when we're in the right situation and we turn it on. In the South, if you shake when you talk about the Lord and your voice is a little shaky, it means you're more spiritual. The more voice shake you have, the more spiritual you are. You know, oh, praise the Lord, brother. Let me tell you today, God is good. Amen. All the time and all the time. Yes, God is good. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> I remember going to a convention with some friends of mine, and I ran into a pastor that talked that way, and those guys walked away thinking that guy was extra spiritual because he sounded extra spiritual, because he was trying to tame his tongue. I don't know what was in that man's heart. But you and I do the same thing where we try to learn the right things to say and we try to act on cue. And we can try to tame that tongue, but eventually something's going to come out, whether in public or in private, that's going to show what's really in our heart. And that's what James is trying to get across. He's saying, you guys are desiring to be teachers. You're desiring to be mature. But if you really want to be mature, you need to look at the heart. Because are the things you're saying is the way you've been treating people because you've been preferring those rich people over the poor people? Is the way that you've been learning all this knowledge, but you have very poor practice and you don't put it into practice, is, is that showing the fruit that your heart is being impacted by the gospel? Because you're still speaking the same junk because you can't tame that tongue. You can try, but you're still speaking the same junk. Has your life been impacted by the gospel? Because if, it's the, if that's the case, then you're going to speak life. And it's not going to be a challenge for you. It's not going to be something that you have to work harder and try harder to do better at. It's going to be something that's going to start coming out of you naturally. It may not be perfect because it's a road to maturity. It's not an A to Z. It's an A to B. It's a step by step. Are you seeing fruit of a changed heart? Are you seeing fruit of a heart that's being impacted by the gospel by the way you speak, by the way you treat other people? By the way that you hear the word and you want to do it and it doesn't seem like a chore, but rather it's a joy because you're grateful for the gospel and you're grateful for the cross. And you see your need because you see how ugly your sin is and you see how great His grace is and you respond accordingly. You see, that's the type of heart that doesn't have to worry about the right words to say because all of a sudden it doesn't become what I do, it becomes who I am. You know, when it's who I am, I can rest. When I get to be myself, I can rest. Amen? Amen? The more comfortable I am with who I am, the more I can rest. The more I feel the need to have to put on, the more exhausted I get. When you go to family reunions, you get exhausted. <laughs> Why? When you go to high school reunions, you get exhausted. Why? Because there's a certain degree of pressure that you feel to have to meet someone else's expectations. 
and it's contrary to who you really are. And the more you play act, the more you get worn out. The people you like spending the most time with are those you have to pretend the least around. The people you get tired of the quickest are those that you have to keep smiling and grinning. I'll never forget one time we were taking family pictures when Josiah was first born. And the photographer said, all right, everybody, smile. All right, smile, smile. And I don't know what happened to me, but a smile got froze on my face. And I couldn't get rid of it. I was walking around like this. All right, thanks for that. That was great. I really appreciate you taking our pictures. So when do you think they'll be ready? He said, sir, you can turn it off. I was like, turn what off? What are you talking about? He said, you're still smiling. I said, I am? I didn't realize I was still smiling. Oh, oh, wow, that actually hurt. Wow, that, wow, I feel a sense of relief now. It's because I had to put on for the camera. Just like you and I feel we have to put on for other people. But if I can truly relax and be who he's created me to be and allow his grace to influence my heart, then I'm going to speak life. I'm not going to be seeking attention. I'm going to be seeking giving glory to him through what he's doing in my life. And I'm going to make it less about me and more about him. Amen? Amen. A selfish heart's going to desire attention and a selfish heart will not submit to authority. The words that that type of heart speaks with the tongue reveal what's truly in that heart because maturity is going to submit to authority. Maturity is going to seek out and submit authority and say, I need authority in my life. I need to submit authority. I need people holding me accountable. I need people who can speak openly, honestly, and candidly in my life. Like I said earlier, I have men in my life that speak to me who they are not impressed with me. And you need people who are not impressed with you. People that you don't wow and razzle and dazzle. People that aren't blinded by your giftedness, that they see that you're still a human being and that you still need Jesus and you still need grace and you still put your pants on one leg at a time. Amen, somebody? And they don't put you in a position in their eyes that you should never be in in the first place because pride comes before fall. And we see over and over again in the media how so many people are put in positions of prominence and they begin to catch traction. And then next thing you know, there's a scandal in the media and it hurts people in their wake. That shouldn't be in the body of Christ. But unfortunately, it's all too common because people aren't submitting to authority. They're not being real. They're not being transparent. They're not willing to be accountable. They think they're above accountability. They think they're above authority. And so they're just going to go do what they feel like they need to do, whether it's time for them to do it, whether, they feel, whether, whether others think that it's wise or not, because they refuse to submit. People push through, and they want to they get married bef- before they have truly submitted to authority, and they've asked in a respectful way, can I have your daughter's hand? People want to rebel against their bosses at their jobs thinking that their bosses are morons and idiots and they may well be morons and idiots. But they're still in a position of authority and unless they're asking you to do something unethical, it's still your role to submit. Amen? Amen. It doesn't matter what's going on. You need to put yourself in a position where you're willing to submit to authority because that reveals and shows maturity. Let's wrap up James here. Let's start in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? So in other words, who thinks you're wise and understanding? Could you imagine James preaching this message? Lift your hand this morning if you think you're wise and have understanding. Everybody would be like freaked out to raise their hand, right? (laughs) He said, if you think you are, then by your good conduct, let him show his works with meekness and wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and be false to the truth. In other words, don't justify your actions. Don't make it something that it's not. You need to see yourself as you truly are. If you're boasting and being selfish and you have selfish ambition, you need to recognize the ugliness of your selfish ambition and repent. We don't hear enough sermons about repentance. Amen or oh me. Verse 15. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it's earthly and spiritual and demonic. Those who are selfish those who are bitter and jealous. He said, that's demonic and unspiritual. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, every kind of disorder and every vile practice will be. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. 
and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is the fruit of a mature life that's submitted to authority, that's not seeking attention, that speaks life. This is the fruit of a life that gets it, is that this person is not going to be out for themselves. This person is not going to be out causing problems. This person is not going to be out being unspiritual and demonic when they think they're very spiritual with their actions. But maturity seeks to make peace and not so strife. Not show partiality. You remember in James 2 where he deals with the issue of class separation. He's tying this back into this because this is still in the same thought of what he wrote in James 2. Not where you're looking down on others. Not because you view yourself as so high and mighty. This is a life that hasn't submitted to the grace of God to allow His grace to truly change us. So if you think yourself wise, don't seek a position to teach Seek a position to serve. If you think you're wise, don't seek a position to teach. Seek a position to serve. In other words, I'm not saying don't pursue being a teacher if God has gifted you and called you to do that. I'm saying don't seek the position for the wrong reason. Don't seek the attention. Don't seek the praise of others. Don't seek those things that would cause you to move outside of submission to authority. Don't Seek those things that will cause you to have to compare yourself with another person and put them down and speak negatively towards them. Instead, move with maturity and speak life. So are you a peacemaker or are you stirring strife up and gossiping and comparing yourself to others? Are you thinking that you're more spiritual than another person and you make lists and compare with how they're not as spiritual as you and how you have the right to be in some sort of seat to say whether or not they're doing what they should be doing in their walk with God. See, he said we need to guard our hearts against that. Now, maturity doesn't seek attention. It speaks life and it submits to authority. And the only way to grow in the definition of maturity is submit to the work of grace that God wants to do in your heart. This may sound overly simple, but you do this by recognizing you need Jesus. Because you never stop needing Jesus. You never stop needing His grace and the gospel. You never stop needing the message of the cross. Because the message of the cross should be showing us our condition and showing us our need for Him. So do you need Jesus? I want to ask you this question before we leave. Do you need Jesus? Here's the thing. My family and I went on vacation to the Dells for four days about two or three months ago got one of those sit through our spiel and we'll give you like a you know free thing we did that you know cheap vacation a little, little quick getaway and while we were away the man that delivers our five gallons of bottled water stopped by and he delivered five gallons of water well i didn't need those gallons of water because i had forgotten that he was going to come by a couple weeks prior and he brought five bottles then But then they had a change of driver who had a change of schedule, and he brought another five. So plus the three bottles I already had in my house, I now currently have 13 five-gallon bottles of water (laughs) at my house in like a two-week time frame. We're not going to go through that much. We may do two or three a month. And I was sitting there looking at all that. And I'm the type of person that likes things a certain way in my home, and I'm very picky. And for me to have these awful, gross-looking, blue, five-gallon containers that don't go with anything in my house and mess up my whole order. (laughs) Makes me twitch a little bit. I've got a lot of water at my house, but I was sitting at the table the other day looking at those stupid bottles of water that you just can't... There's no good place to put them. They're right there in my kitchen. It's ridiculous. And I thought, you know what? It's okay because I always need water. I never stop needing water. I will eventually run out of that water and I will still need water after that's over with even though I have a stockpile for the rest of the year. There's going to come a time where I need water again, will there not? You see, it doesn't matter how much I stockpile it. It doesn't matter how much you come to church. It doesn't matter how much you read your Bible. It doesn't matter how much you pray. You never stop needing Jesus. 
you never get to a point where you say, I don't need any more water. Don't ever give me water again. I've got plenty right here. You don't ever get to a point where you say, I've already heard James. I've got enough of James. I don't, I've already heard a message on the power of the tongue. I, I don't need that message again. No, you never stop needing that message. You never stop needing the gospel. You never stop needing grace because we always need to be reminded of our need. And the more we're reminded of our need, the sweeter the gospel becomes to us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That anything good that comes out of me is a work of grace in my heart that he's doing. Any good works that flow out of my life are an overflow of grace at work in my heart. And that when I speak life, it's not because all of the sudden... I tried to tame my tongue to speak life, but rather I recognize the source of life and he's changing my heart and out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth begins to speak life. Then it doesn't become hard. Then it doesn't become a play thing that I have to do and act and turn it on. It becomes something natural that comes out of me because I recognize my need. Thank you for listening. For more information, please visit wogcc.com.